Welcome to the photoelectric effect part three. In this video we're going to be uh, continuing to take a look at the effect of frequency on the maximum kinetic energy of photoelectrons. Uh, specifically what we're going to do is focus on the work and experiments by Max Planck and take a look at his results and conclusions based on those experiments. Once again, in order to uh, participate in this video, I'd like to ask you to go to uh, this website right here and make sure you download the simulation for the photoelectric effect. Uh, once downloaded, that's actually probably where we're going to start today. When downloaded, uh, you should have something that looks like this. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and download that simulation and pause this video and we'll be right back. All right, uh, we're going to start with the simulation here. Uh, and there's various parameters here that we're going to want you to get set in order to understand this. We're going to take and turn the intensity of our light all the way up to 100%. We're going to take and turn our frequency down uh, all the way down into infrared and this should say sodium the battery should read zero degrees down here and we're going to activate this third graph set on sodium what Max Planck did was he experimented with various types of materials and metals uh, in for the metal plates here inside the evacuated quartz tube and he found some pretty interesting uh, so found some pretty interesting stuff. When you start in turn to turn up the frequency here from infrared now running through in order the colors of the visible spectrum, plates are made out of sodium right there. In the green range, we see that photoelectrons are just starting to be emitted from the sodium plates. As we continue up through the visible spectrum and then above into ultraviolet, you can clearly see that as we do that, the photoelectrons fly off of, these sod of this sodium plate with more kinetic energy. So the higher the frequency, the more the energy they're flying off the plate. We can also demonstrate that. Let's go back down here to say a visible blue color. Okay, Look at the stopping voltage that will be required to prevent the electrons from hitting uh, this negative plate over here as we slowly turn it up. not even a volt necessary. However, if we turn this way up as far as we can get in the ultraviolet, notice how uh, photoelectrons are still hitting the negative plate over here, which requires a much greater stopping potential. In fact, we can't even, oh, there we go. Uh, finally, up to eight volts we can get most of the photoelectrons to stop hitting that negative plate even though even then we don't get them all to have to have that happen so a bunch of conclusions drawn here one uh, you note that photoelectrons don't don't start coming off of this plate immediately that it requires some minimum frequency and I think we found that to be we set this back to zero so we can actually get some to fly off of there wasn't until we got into these green wavelengths that photoelectrons even started and then once we did it required greater uh, stopping potential to stop them which means the uh, electrons have greater energy. What we'd like to do now is uh, let's experiment with a different metal. So go up here to the drop down menu and change this to zinc. Okay. Uh, back at sodium what was the frequency 
right in there. So this is the frequency right here at which uh, photoelectrons just start for sodium. Let's see if it varies for zinc. So we change this to zinc. We turn this up. It's still going. Still going. And it wasn't until we got into here into uh, ultraviolet somewhere in here where you can see photoelectrons started being emitted uh, from the from the zinc plates. Obviously we would do the same thing here adjusting the battery if we wanted to figure out how much energy they actually had. That's how they did that. Turn this all the way back down, change it to copper. And it required even greater frequency before photoelectrons would be emitted from the copper plates. Platinum. Right there. So about 1.5 times 10 to the 15th hertz up in ultraviolet before photoelectrons are emitted. And calcium. Okay, at about 0.8, point, you know, a little bit above 0.75 here before they're admitted uh, from the plate. And same thing. What you also notice is that a common relationship between all these graphs, which is hard to tell them one at a time, It'd be nice on this if we could have them all plotted here, is that what do you notice about the slopes of all these lines? There's a slope on sodium. There's a slope on zinc. There's a slope on copper. And not to beat it to death, let's just skip the calcium. Pretty amazing find. All the slopes appear to be parallel to each other. So every single metal has the same slope on this energy versus frequency graph. All right, for more understanding on this, we're going to go back to our notes, and we'll see you there in a second. All right, back here at our notes, a um, couple things that we're going to take a look at here. We just have a sample here, sample graph of kinetic energy in electron volts. Remember, that's an alternate unit of energy versus frequency. I want to start by saying that this data is not probably to correct scale. Um, this is just for um, understanding the principles here. So I couldn't tell you what actual metals these are or um, if the, the value of the slopes turn out to be accurate or not. It's just for conceptual understanding. Nonetheless, uh, as we just demonstrated with the simulation, uh, what Planck was finding was that as he experimented with various metals, um, suppose this metal gave, you know, we'll call it metal A, gave this particular slope. Uh, when he experimented with metal B, it maybe gave him that particular slope. Okay, uh, Metal C, maybe that gave him that slope. And then uh, Metal D, maybe that gave that slope right there. Okay, So what we learned from this is, as we noted before, notice that each metal has a unique frequency with which a photoelectron start to be emitted from uh, the metal itself. Uh, this is given a special term called the threshold frequency. And we don't talk about X intercepts very often, but that's actually what it is on this graph. The threshold frequency, the frequency at which photoelectrons just start to be emitted from metal, is actually the X intercept on the graph. So if you're ever asked that and you're given a graph, that's where you find that piece of information. 
The other thing that we note from this is that the slopes uh, of all four of these metals are parallel to each other. So the slopes are the same. That's a pretty interesting and unique find. So what were some of the conclusions that Planck drew from his work? The first, which we've just been stating, is that there is what is called a threshold th frequency. Okay, and that's a unique frequency. Given the symbol F with a subscript uh, O, or F naught is often it's called. Uh, so the fresh threshold frequency is the X intercept at which photoelectrons just start to be emitted. And each metal has its own unique threshold frequency. The other conclusion that can be clearly drawn here is that the greater the frequency shown on the plate, the greater the energy. So what we draw from this is that the energy is directly proportional to the frequency. How can we go from saying that to saying that the energy is equal to the frequency? Well, we've been down this road many times. What we need is a proportionality constant to, to equate those two quantities. And of course, the proportionality constant always comes from the slope of the graph. And because it was Planck who did all this work, this slope became known as Planck's constant and was given the symbol lowercase h. So h is the proportionality constant uh, that allows us to equate e and f into an equation. That's e equals hf. You also may say that, see this equation in a different form because if we take uh, the equation for the speed of light, and then we'll start with a wave equation, v equals f lambda, which if we apply that specifically to light would be c equals f lambda. And if we solve that for f, that of course would be c divided by lambda. And if we took that value of f and substituted for f and e equals hf, this of course would become e equals hc over lambda. Okay. So two variations there of the photoelectric equation uh, that relates energy and frequency. Okay. And the last conclusion, number three here, is that the slope is the same for all metals. And when we calculate the numerical value of that slope, if our energy is in joules and our frequency is in hertz, we get a value that's 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds, joule seconds. If you look on your reference table on the constants page, on the, on the front page of the New York State reference table, you'll find that value. If the energy, like this graph, is given in electron volts, our slope turns out to be 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds. I would encourage you to add that value to your personal reference table. Uh, it allows, and if you memorize that, it would allow you to take a lot of shortcuts if the energy was given in electron volts. So there it is. There's uh, Plank, uh, Max Planck's experiments. Um, pretty neat work that he did with various metals, determining various energies required, threshold frequency, the fact that the greater the frequency equals the greater energy, and that they all have a common slope of, of 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, which is called Planck's constant. This, of course, was just work that added to verify uh, the previous discussions that we've had and discoveries on the photoelectric effect. Thanks, and come back for part four.